campaigned gone differently than you, given what you know about your state in the firmament a year ago? Has this campaign, uh, how, how is the campaign different than you expected? I just, from day one, I believed that most people were good. And I just leaned into that, and I've been out there talking for a year and a half to people, explaining what happened in the fall election of 2020, explaining the Election Integrity Act, and then taking me farther back, uh, talking about the 2018 race when Stacey Abrams lost by 55,000 votes. And I said, voter suppression that she alleged was never supported by the facts. We had record registrations, record turnout. Then the voter fraud narrative that we had in 2020 wasn't supported by the facts. And I said, really, what happens is it really disrupts uh, society. It's not helpful. But here are what the facts. And I just really had fact-based conversations with everyone. I went to Rotary, Kiwanis, chamber meetings, um, Republican Party, Tea Party in North Georgia. But I would talk to anyone just to share my story and then take their questions and answer them. I think that was really the best method for it because I knew at the end of the day that most people are good and Georgians are wonderful. Um, what do supporters of Donald Trump when they see you tell you? Well, they have their, these concerns, and, and some of them are still holding on to them. I said, well, well sir or ma'am, you know, and then I explain about these uh, issues, every one that they raise. And I know that they're disappointed in the results. I get that, but here are what the facts are. And so you just gently explain you know, that 28,000 people skipped the presidential race. They didn't vote for anyone, and yet they voted down ballot. That there weren't 10,000 dead people that voted, there was only four. And so I just give them facts, but I try and do that with grace, because when people are hurting, you have to really, you know, be soft with your message. Uh, you're not trying to, uh, you know, you're not trying to, you know, make points. You're just trying to give them information. Uh, like I said, most people are good when you give them the facts, and they come to their own, you know, uh, conclusion. And sometimes we go to the football game and we get disappointed on Friday night, but you understand that's what the point total is, and they walk home, but they understand well. We have a game next week, and we can come back and you know practice hard, and hopefully we win the next one. Do Democrats talk to you about supporting you? Uh, not really. Uh, I, I guess that that's out there, and I'm, I'm really gratified that I really have built a broad-based coalition because in this office, we do we're unique somewhat. You could say is because we touch people's most precious right, and that's the franchise to vote. And I think they really appreciate that there's a guy that'll stand in the gap. He'll do what's right. He'll buck his party bosses. And he'll make sure we have fair and honest elections. And my opponent, she can't say that. You know, the Democrat Party has bought 1.9 million of her ads. She's beholden to Stacey Abrams. And my, my people that are supporting me are just average people up and down the line, business owners, uh, small, uh, you know, up small town, uh, small town and pro entrepreneurs, and then just individual people that send me money out of the blue. But it's mostly all Georgia money and just people that, you know, want to contribute to our campaign, but we won't match them dollar for dollar. But it uh, doesn't matter. We've got the people behind us, and I'm really gratified by that um, because I've been expecting and I've been relying, and I've been gratified to learn that I was right. Most people are good, and I think that's the best mm -hmm. message. I should, sometimes you watch the evening news, and it gets you disillusioned about what you see out there. Yes, but, you know, you go to the local towns, local cities, you know, People are just working hard. They're struggling with inflation. They're struggling with gas prices, but their their hearts are good. And I think they you know, want to look for people that really understand that my job is to follow the law and follow the Constitution. Do you get the sense that Republicans are ready to move on from Donald Trump? And are you ready to? Well, I'm running my own race based on my own merits and based on my own principles. And my principle is integrity, character, honest, civil discourse. And I believe, to quote Reagan, kindness. You can be a principled conservative and still be kind. And so I think that's, uh, uh, there's a war for kindness and I'm out there sharing the facts, but with kindness. Ready to move on from Donald Trump? Well, I, I, I believe in the conservative principles of the Republican Party. You have to understand this party was founded in 1850. It was just a great noble idea that all men all people were created equal, and everyone deserved that franchise to vote. And we're talking about individual responsibility, individual opportunity, and that's why it's just great when you see people come here and they're self-made in America, that they didn't have this opportunity in other countries where they come here and they just work hard. And uh, it's just, 
you know, exciting to see people pull them up by the bootstraps, so to speak. And then we have systems in place to have that. So we have a strong educational system. We have economic opportunity for everyone. And everyone has the chance to vote. So we have fair and honest elections. Is it reasonable to ask you about uh, abortion policy? Well, that's not on the ballot because this office has nothing to do with that. But uh, my, pr my position is clear. And, but at the end of the day, what really matters is that you have someone in this office that will fight hard every day for fair and honest elections for everyone. Make sure that we have, you know, and we can streamline whatever we can for pre professional licensing. We have 550,000 people that require professional license. I'm a licensed structural engineer, licensed civil engineer, and a licensed general contractor. And I want to make sure that we can get people their license as quick as possible, you know, help reduce those continuing education hours that they have to have because there's a cost involved. And then make sure that our corporations, that you can renew your corporation for up to three years. So there's a, it touches a lot of things, but mostly helping people generate you know, their personal wealth, their personal income. Does the Secretary of State's position on abortion affect how the office conducts professional licensing? No, uh, absolutely not. You know, that's not in our wheelhouse. That's in other people's wheelhouse. But mine is making sure you have a fair and honest election. We're getting licenses taken away if they handle the new heartbeat law uh, in a way that uh, that, that uh, maybe ends, maybe uh, takes away licenses. Yeah, that's not in our wheelhouse. Our job is just to make sure you have fair and honest elections. We license people, you know, and you meet the qualifications, the educational qualifications. I got my undergraduate degree in engineering. I had to work for four years. I had to write a test, <coughs> then. I applied for my professional license. Nurses will do the same. Uh, landscape architects will do that. Uh, electricians, plumbers, you know, we want to get people out there so they can get out there in the workforce and put food on the table. And because of high inflation that's happened because of the federal government and what they're doing up there, that's been impacting all Georgians. The polling indicates you might be the most popular Republican in the state. What do you think about that? We've worked hard at building a broad-based coalition. All right, let me uh, ask you about uh, Coffee County. Um, when did the Secretary of State's office first know about Coffee County? Oh, very early on, and uh, we put investigators on it. Um, and then at some point, uh, there's our, our um, resources that we have uh, only go up to a certain point, and we reached out to the GBI because they have additional resources, um, technical resources that they can really do a deep dive on some of the things. Uh, they have a wider purview. We reached out to them. And then as we kept on digging deeper, uh, working with the State Election Board, also the Attorney General's Office, um, then there's been a, a reach out to Federal Investigative Office um, Agency that has uh, even additional resources that uh, transcend our state borders. But it's an ongoing investigation. I will tell you that it's very serious what they've, uh, I've alleged to do. Uh, I don't want to go too far into that, but I believe that if it is supported by what we believe it'll be supported by, they should be prosecuted. And these are criminal violations. And that usually means that people will be behind bars at the end of the day. This is not just paying a fine. And also the state of Georgia has, imp has incurred and will incur financial costs because of what's been done to the voting uh, equipment. And we therefore want that equipment replaced at the other people's cost, not at our cost. And so we'll be proceeding on that. You sent an investigator into Coffee County in May of 2021, and the GBI didn't get called in until uh, more than a year later. Yeah. What happened in the interim? Uh, we were doing our work, uh, investigating, digging deep exactly what was going on. But sometimes you, you reach that point where you need additional power. Uh, first of all, if you want to do subpoenas, uh, that would require the state election board, but you have to understand for well over six months, we didn't have a chair of the state election board because the existing uh, chair had then uh, moved to another state agency, and so we had a vacancy there. And so it took a while to finally get an acting uh, chair that we could do the subpoena, which was what we did uh, with True the Vote to get that information. And that's been stymied because they're not providing, that, they're not being a cooperating um, organization in that investigation. So we were somewhat stymied on that, and then the GBI didn't have that hurdle. So we reached out to them, but also uh, some of the resources we needed are capabilities that they do have. Because it's criminal versus a process of elections. Uh, the plaintiffs in the lawsuit unearthed the surveillance video in Coffee County. Um, shouldn't your office have 
been able to do that under the open Well, they actually thing? should have released that sooner, and they were holding on to that. They wanted, I guess, some kind of a gotcha moment uh, playing on the legal side. Uh, when you hear about potential illegality, I think you have a responsibility as a responsible American citizen mm -hmm. to give that to law enforcement agencies instead of playing, trying to play a political gotcha moment game. Should your office have gotten that video when you opened the investigation in 2021 rather than it emerging a few weeks ago? Well, that came out of a lawsuit that's been going on since 2017. And that's another matter that's under litigation. So I'll let that go at that. Well, I guess what I'm asking is, I think the, the question is, did the Secretary of State's office take the Coffee County issue seriously? And if you had, wouldn't you have been able to get this information months ago? Well, we were give, provided information, and now it, is a, it appears to be apparent that these people were not speaking truthfully to our investigators. All right. Um, Gabriel Sterling said in April of this year that there was, that nothing happened in Coffee County. Do you know why he said that? Because it, it has, it appears to be apparent that the people were not providing truthful testimony uh, as part of that investigation process. And it appears that testimony was provided to a grand jury that was not supported by the truth. And I'll let it go at that because it's an ongoing investigation. All right. Um, so um, do you th does, the, does what happened in Coffee County uh, represent a threat to uh, this November's election? No, that uh, service were replaced uh, for that particular county. But it does to show that uh, it is very important that county election, you can have a rogue actor. Uh, that's what we had uh, apparently down in uh, Coffee County. And so it's very important that uh, we are looking, that when you swear that oath to follow the state law, follow the SEB regulations, and then also make sure that you're following the Constitution of the state of Georgia and the United States Constitution, that you have people of integrity in all these offices. And when you find that people don't have that integrity, that they need to be replaced, they need to be terminated. And if there were violations, they need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of law. If a bad actor wanted to undermine the upcoming election, wouldn't they do something exactly like they did in Colorado? They would County? attempt to do that, but you have to also understand, and I would hope all voters understand this, that when you make your selections, you know, on the, the ballot marking device and it prints it out, you can look in there and did you vote for Mary or did you vote for Bob for that particular race? You get to look at your ballot, then you walk it over to the scanner and then you put that in the scanner and it is where it is scanned and then eventually it is tabulated. If there's any question of what happens with a ballot marking device, you'll see it immediately. So you can, the voter can verify that their vote was accurately counted. So you've taken that out that that could be a potential area of fraud. Then when you go over to the scanner and you scan it, that's why you do audits, and that's why we do LNA testing. And that's why one county uh, down in South Georgia did their LNA testing just a few days ago, earlier in the week, and other counties are doing it all sorts of times. And I, we see when those reports are. I know DeKalb County is doing theirs. Uh, the uh, absentee is on one day, the early vote is on another day, and then the election day you know, LNA testing is, will be on the third day. But I say all that is the county is doing the LNA logic and accuracy testing right now. But also we're gonna follow that up after the election with audits, and that means races can be audited. Any race, because you have a paper ballot, and that is the official ballot, you can audit that race to verify the count. And that's what we did in 2020. And many people don't realize that all five million pieces of paper, all five million ballots were hand recounted. Mm -hmm. And you looked at the human readable text. Who did you vote for president? Donald J. Trump, Joseph R. Biden, or Joe Jorgensen, Liber Libertarian? And when you do that, and you get the same result, Many of the counties had no vote total differences. When you get the same result uh, uh, so as you got with the scanners, it shows that the machines did not flip the votes. They actually recorded the results. And I understand that people were uh, disappointed that on my side of the aisle, and I get that, but the machines mm -hmm. were verified that they're accurate. And also, people need to understand, we just didn't buy these things right off the shelf that goes through several years of going through the United States Election Assistance Commission. The General Assembly put in that any new machine that was gonna be used, any process, any company, had to have certified machines from the United States Election Assistance Commission. 
we did that, and then once we got these machines, we then went ahead and did our own testing, uh, our own in-house testing, and then we, after post-election of 2020, we sent a, a sample size out with Pro V and V. All right, last question. Um, you're opposed to switching out the computerized voting machines with hand-marked paper ballots. Why are you so opposed to that? Well, I think that uh, Secretary of State Kathy Cox made the best point, and she happened to be a Democrat. But what she said is all during the 90s, before we had electronic voting, she said we were some counties down in Bibb County and other parts. We, we had people that didn't have the same skill or same educational background as you might have in an urban area. That what they saw is they had sometimes 11 to 13 percent of overvotes, undervotes, you know, double counting, rejected ballots, people that were disenfranchised. And she said, as soon as we went to the electronic machines, the rate of disenfranchisement went down to a very low percentage because you, you eliminated those overvotes and undervotes. I don't want anyone to be disenfranchised. And with a ballot marking device, which it prints out, you can look exactly who you wanted. But when you do a hand-marked paper battle, what happens if they mark something a little bit different and all of a sudden you have a team, politicians or lawyers from each political party looking at that and they're taking this to court and trying to win a, a court battle. I think it sh the battle should be at the ballot box, not at the courthouse. And that's where it's really important that you, your vote will count. It'll be recorded accurately. And that's why I think Kathy Cox spoke wisdom during the Safe Commission about that specific issue. And many of the Republicans felt the same way. They uh, didn't want to have a Bush v. Gore type of situation. I think what people need to understand, when you win, you win, and you lose. You lost that day, but you can come back and run again in two years or four years or six years, whatever that term is.